Commission Factory. Hey there, hustlers. Welcome back to another episode of Flex Your Hustle. And sadly, this will be the last for the year. It's been an absolute pleasure to host the season again for another round of great ideas. Thank you so much for listening, for the great feedback and conversation. We've had so many inspiring stories and wonderful guests on the show. So a huge thank you to all of our guests who've joined us this season. We're capping off the season with a fun and interesting chat with Verity Rowe. Verity is the marketing manager for Australia at Lululemon, a brand that should need no introduction. Known for adorning SUV driving mums and ladies who love to lazily brush. Lululemon has built a cult-like following for its premium quality athleisure wear that can bridge both workout and play. In this conversation, we discuss how Lululemon has managed to build and grow their sales without promotion or couponing. No easy feat in today's climate and how the brand continues to leverage affiliate marketing successfully despite this strategy. Verity, thank you so much for joining us today. So excited. For the listeners out there, why don't you do a little introduction to yourself and what you do at Lululemon? Sure. Well, thanks for having me. This is my first time on a podcast. So very nervous and excited. My name is Verity. I am the digital marketing manager at Lululemon in Australia. We cover Australia and New Zealand. I have been at Lululemon for three and a half years. I look after all of the performance marketing channels, which obviously span across the digital remit. I work really closely with our brand team and our e-commerce team. I guess I've come from a pretty varied background. I started in a fairly similar but different role in the kind of activewear industry. I started my career with Adidas a long time ago now, but in the sports marketing field, so Mm -hmm. quite different to where I sit now. I found myself at a digital agency, which is where I really started to hone my skills in the digital and performance marketing space. But while I was at that agency, I did my postgrad in digital marketing just to really round my skills out in the space. And through that process, I found this role at Lululemon and found myself applying, thinking there's no way I'm going to get this role. They're way too big. They're way too cool. (laughs) But yeah, I managed to land the role myself and here I am. Congratulations. It's no easy feat getting into a really incredible brand like Lululemon, but obviously they've seen something in you, which we're going to talk about today because you really have made quite a transformation to the business and their marketing in the fairly short time that you've been there, right? You haven't been there that long. No, not really that long, although it does feel like an age. (laughs) And so why don't we talk about When you started at Lululemon, obviously you've got quite a breadth of experience. So what was it like when you got in there? And especially with your background, what were the first things that you were thinking about? When I first started at Lululemon, I was the first internal hire in the Australia business for the digital marketing team. Previously, the digital marketing strategy and implementation had all been handled by agency or freelancers. I was really starting with a net new role and built the strategy from the ground up. So I was feeling overwhelmed (laughs) and probably like I had a bit of imposter syndrome. Oh, totally. I was thinking the same thing. I'm like, I would be so excited and pumped for it, but also terrified. That was probably the two biggest feelings I had when I first started. I was interviewing through the early months of 2020, so January and February. I didn't start until April. So the world had changed a lot Mm. from the time I got the offer and then actually started. So starting from home online, trying to make relationships with people across the business online was such an experience. And then, yeah, developing the strategy for all of our performance marketing channels from the ground up. It was no easy feat, but I think I was able to lean on quite a lot of resources. We obviously have teams across the globe in other regions that I was able to connect with and learn from. COVID was really an uncertain space, but being an active wear business, we definitely didn't struggle through the pandemic period. I, I think. don't think I wore anything else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure I was like, that was it. Wake up. Yeah. Take your pajamas off, put your active wear on. That was my uniform. You were not alone. We all did <laughs> the same thing, especially working from home. You had to be business at the top, comfort at the bottom. Yep. Definitely wasn't a bad time to be selling stretchy leggings. You're such a big global organization. Maybe people don't underestimate just how how widespread Lululemon is across the globe. What were the things that were kind of happening at the time that you could lean on? And then what were some of the things that you had to, I guess, put simply Australianify? Yeah, we're a Canadian company and we're massive 
in North America across women's and men's wear, which a lot of people are actually surprised to find out we do men's wear. Mm. Being a brand that was kind of grounded in women's yoga originally, the awareness of our men's wear range is somewhat small in comparison to our women's wear range, which we're working really hard to change. But I think there's still a bit of work to go there. In terms of leaning on our teams in North America, in Europe, And in Asia was really helpful for me when I first started in kind of understanding what strategies do and don't work for our market. But then Australia-ifying it um, (laughs) was definitely important because we're obviously at different stages of kind of market maturity. Australia was the first international region outside of North America that the brand came to. So our maturity is actually quite high, particularly in women's wear. But I think in terms of like the business structure and strategy, things that work for say the US where there's like really big population don't necessarily translate into what we do here in Australia with such a small population. People are really into wearing active wear. I come from Melbourne where it's basically the cafe outfit of the day. Yes. I live in Bondi, which is classic Lululemon territory, right? You've got the mums that basically go for a walk on the beach and then go meet their girlfriends and then go drop their kids off. And they basically live in Lululemons. And so for that kind of demographic, I guess it's kind of like, how do you fit that into a style? How do you demonstrate that can take you from day to night and how you could dress it up in little pieces? Whereas maybe some other markets, they are more exercise conscious and it is a way because it tucks them in and keeps them tight while they're doing their yoga, right? Exactly. You summed it up perfectly. (laughs) I've done a lot of customer journey mapping in my time (laughs) and I'm also kind of probably your target market. (laughs) So, I mean, I think it's really interesting because you stepped into this role and it was a performance marketing role, right? You really had to really ramp up what you were doing in performance marketing because I would probably argue that Lululemon doesn't have a brand awareness issue, right? It's a bit of a cult product, particularly for the Eastern Suburbs moms like myself, hate to say it. But what I would say is it is really interesting because performance marketing for a lot of marketers is price promotion driven. And that's actually, from your strategy perspective, something you do not do, right? Yeah, so we consider ourselves sort of like a premium offering, you know. We believe in our products. We put a lot of work into the development of our products. So for us, you know, selling our product is more about communicating its benefits rather than kind of leaning into driving price conscious sales. So I think when, as you say, brand awareness is not a huge issue, but I think we're not like, we're not a breakout brand, you know, we're Mm. we're established and we're known in the market. So shying away from kind of promotional style messaging and into kind of the why. I think Lululemon is one of those brands that it has a cult status in its own right. I mean, in my eyes, and I'm one of the target market, it sits up there with the Nikes of the world, right? It's got a very recognisable icon that sits on your clothing and extremely comfortable and wonderful to live in all day. And so I would probably argue that by building that brand first and building that, I guess, iconic status... It's a big call, actually, me saying that Lululemon is a bit iconic, but I do feel it is a bit iconic, certainly with some demographics. Yeah, I think you're definitely right. If you're kind of like a new business, new starter, and your brand name's not well known, that can be a real challenge. It could be an easy win to kind of lean into price promotion. You know, once upon a time, Lululemon was a small brand, and Mm. we still managed to get to this point. So, you know, we're not that old. We're not as old as Nike, for example. I think if you believe in your product promise as a brand and the quality of your product, and that's the kind of messaging you want to use for your marketing, I would say stick to your guns if that's something that you Mm. really believe in, because standing behind your brand beliefs is always going to be a more beneficial strategy in the long term. I mean, it's great advice for anyone out there looking to create a new athleisure wear brand or any brand, really. I think what Lululemon has done very well is found a way to infiltrate culture. And so if that's something that you want to stand by, you just have to be much more clever about how you become that product that is part of culture. I think you guys have done that really well. You picked a great demographic and went for it. So with that in mind, not budging on the price promotion, 
very disappointed. What does performance look like for you then? Yeah, so we obviously work across a real spectrum of channels. We're pretty much in every digital marketing channel that we could be in. So performance really, like if we zoom out, is filling the top of the funnel with prospective guests. People who maybe have never tried our brand before, but have heard of it. Maybe they've never heard of us. Maybe they're brand loyal somewhere else. I mean, it sounds so cliche and standard, but I think it really works when you focus on each phase and curating messaging. It's continuing to create a really premium experience after the conversion that drives someone to become a brand loyal guest in your database. Mm -hmm. So I would say performance looks like a really healthy acquisition strategy, and then also a really healthy retention strategy. And the two work together to continually grow your business. I've used that analogy a lot in the past of a leaky bucket. Yes. So if you are not focusing just as much on your retention and your lifetime value of your customer, you're just going to continue to leak those customers. There's something really interesting that you mentioned when we caught up earlier about that customer journey and how you're personalizing the website experience. I think there's only a few brands that I generally see that are really going to the level that you guys are. So can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think personalization is one of those topics. It's a hot topic in the digital marketing world. And I think it's one of those ones that goes hand in hand with privacy and understanding how your data is being used. For us, we have a little fun quiz on our site, which will kind of ingest the information and spit out a recommendation, which is algorithmic led based on your answers. So if you get to our leggings page and you're a bit confused because there's so 17 many <laughs> different black leggings on the site and you don't know the difference between yes. them I mean you wouldn't be alone so I think that is a really simple way so to simple. ensure especially for e-commerce where you don't have that ability to kind of talk with the retail team about what you're looking for I mean for us it was like one way that we could bring that kind of store style experience to our e-commerce website What I love as well is it recognizes that each of your customer is different. And so they're going to be using it in a different way. Some will really just want to use it to look stylish when they go have, you know, brunch with their girlfriends, whereas others are, you know, active. They're out there and they're, you know, at the gym every day and they want a really good quality legging that's going to last the distance. And so I think that's what I really like about that as well, that it's recognizing not every customer is the same. You're not homogenous. You don't all just look for a black tie. Are you buying for an occasion? What's the weather going to be like there? Are you hiking or walking? Really tailored questions to get to the heart of what's going to be the best product. And as a consumer, it helps you make a decision more confidently. Exactly. And not to mention you get all that incredibly rich information about who that customer is, what they like, how they use the product. You don't just have information on what they've bought. You've got what they're thinking and their intentions. Yeah. And that can customise everything from your CRM to more. So, you know, that data is really valuable. I'm going to switch gears though, because I really want to talk about affiliate marketing with you because you didn't really do affiliate marketing before stepping into this role, did you? No, I didn't. I was brand new to affiliate marketing when I joined Lululemons. When I first started, my manager said, oh, like you've got all this great experience on performance marketing channels. By the way, you're also going to be managing our affiliate program. I thought, nothing like a challenge. I've always been one to learn. So first thing I did was jump onto Apple Podcasts and start listening to every podcast I could find about affiliate marketing. So I kind of feel like I'm paying it forward now by being here and talking to you about affiliate marketing. I love that. We are all eternally learning. And so it's totally okay to step into a role where you have to do something you've never done before. But I love that you just kind of leaned in and went, okay, I'm going to figure this out. So what does the program look like? Without giving too much away, we're across the full spectrum of publisher styles. So I would say when I first started, it was really easy to lean into kind of cashback because of the performance that you get out of it. 
I mean, you see the dollars rolling in and you're like, wow, this is great. The ROAS on this is so high. And when you look at the return on ad spend from the affiliate channel, you're like, wow, I could never achieve this in other channels. So it's really easy to lean into that kind of loyalty, promotional cashback side of affiliate marketing. And I think a lot of people who don't know much about affiliate marketing, that's all they see from this space. And it's really easy for... I guess anyone who's not really close to the strategy of affiliate marketing to just assume that the only thing you can do in the space is offer cash back, which I think I would absolutely challenge. You know, we've seen a lot of success out of leaning further into content partnerships. You know, we work with a really robust number of content publishers on our program and it's become a really important part of the strategy in terms of driving not only the conversions that come out of the affiliate channel, but also the brand awareness and the consideration components. So you do see a kind of full funnel strategy forming in the affiliate side, which I think a lot of people miss when they look at the channel. Yeah. And there's that brand alignment too, right? Because there are a lot of premium properties. I mean, you can get access to our media properties. You can get access to Qantas yep. rewards. Like there are a lot of premium spaces where you can still promote your product with an affiliate approach, which affiliate is really, it's just the way that it's monetized, really. I think in people's heads, they think affiliate, well, that's the way that it, my brand comes across, but it's not. There are a multitude of different ways. So, you know, there's a lot of great premium areas that you can align your brand with that are also premium brands, right? Absolutely. I mean, we have such great relationships with some of those publishers that you mentioned and they really are premium brands in their own right brands like Qantas, R Media you know they've got all those massive premium publishing houses that they work with which you think of magazines that you would only dream of getting into and this is a really easy way to get your brand into a magazine like Vogue for example so being able to kind of lean in and reach those spaces that maybe a PR team might not even be able to get you into from an earned pickup has been a real eye-opener for me in this space. And again, I think that comes down to the conversation we've been having about culture, right? So I've worked in publishing houses. I've actually worked at our media. And <laughs> the thing that we used to say when we were there was that we define culture in that business, you know, like magazine editors have to yeah. think three months ahead because that is the deadline where you have to get all your content in for it to be published physically. And so they're not reporting on trends. They're setting trends. They're saying what it's going mm -hmm. to be in three months time. And so, you know, if you are a brand that wants to get into culture, this is a fantastic way of doing it because you're only paying for a sale that comes as a referral from that publication. So from the start of where you're at now to where you started, has your perception changed on a film? Affiliate marketing? Oh my gosh, it has completely transformed. I would say my initial understanding was so limited. I came really from that traditional digital marketing background. I was pretty much just, you know, Google and Facebook. So this was just such a whole new world. And when I kind of dove in and started learning, you know, I, I really have to throw out a shout out to Kate from Commission Factory, Yay. who really helped kind of guide my understanding of the channel. I think we were kind of really stuck in that loyalty and promotion side of affiliate marketing early on. And whilst it's super great, it's just so transactional and it doesn't necessarily align with our broader brand strategy. And we've moved into things like content. So the R medias of the world, but also influencers. We work with LTK as well. I think being able to drive content from not just the print side of publishers, but also from the social media side has really helped to elevate our program in a way that's not so transactional. So I think, yeah, it was a real development for me in my understanding of affiliate marketing and how it could be used more broadly across your entire kind of funnel strategy, just conversions focused. Mm, I love what you mentioned before about working with different influencers and partnering with them. So not just working with them, partnering with them and using their expertise as a way to communicate new product launches. I think that some people mistake affiliate marketing to be just another, here's a bunch of places I'm going to promote my product and let's see what comes back. But actually the best impact is building these really fruitful partnerships with publishers or individuals or influencers who can start to become that brand advocate for you as well. Absolutely. I think 
the influencer space, you could have a whole podcast on that mm. as well, because I think it drives so much more authenticity from like an influencer perspective when you create relationships that are more ongoing versus a one and done style partnership. Yeah. And I think from a consumer perspective, when I see influencers who promote just any old brand and they just are like one, then the next one, then the next one. Shocking. It just doesn't really communicate like a strong message to me. So mm. I think that the influencer world has changed so much in the last 10 years. I think people kind of see through that one and done style of influencer marketing and they really latch on to the specific influencers or creators that they like to follow and the ones that they trust. Yeah, I think the affiliate approach is a great way to get into the influencer marketing game rather than looking at a reach perspective because it doesn't matter. You can hit a great influencer, but I mean, I'll use an example. I saw one the other day, Melbourne mother, beautiful home, quite wealthy, busting out the old Del Paso to cook to her kids. And I'm like, there's no way on earth that you're <laughs> cooking old El Paso for your kids, especially because she was talking about going to a, one of Melbourne's best restaurants yesterday. Do you know what I mean? And so there's an inauthenticity there that sure, she's got the reach and sure your brand was seen, but did anyone actually A, believe that and B, does that help your brand or hurt your brand? I'm not quite sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think targeting influencers in your strategy that have that really engaged following is so much more important than going after influencers that just have a massive follower count engagement would definitely be more important than reach because if that's not your target audience then that message is never going to resonate with their audience yep I have one last question and then we'll wrap, I promise. Regarding affiliate though, I know you guys are doing some really good stuff in the attribution modeling space. So I know you're not allowed to tell me too much. It's top secret. <laughs> but can you say what you can about some of the really interesting ways that you're looking at affiliate and how it is driving not just performance metrics, but awareness and loyalty? Yeah. So I think it's so easy for brands to measure their impact at that last touch level. That's what you see in Google Analytics. When you're looking in your affiliate dashboard, such as the Commission Factory dashboard, you see that kind of post-click model. I think using data-driven and multi-touch modeling to understand the impact that not just the affiliate space, but all of your marketing channels play in that influence of that conversion is really important for understanding things like which channels drive awareness, consideration and conversion. And I think that the affiliate space is seen as a conversion driving channel, similar to the way people see paid search or shopping as really conversion driving channels. But what we kind of can ascertain through that multi-touch modeling is it actually plays a role in every phase of the funnel, including online and offline channels. So we're able to ascertain that there's incrementality in purchases that are made in our retail stores, as well as those that are made on our e-commerce website, driven out of those content partnerships and even things like the cashback sites. They all play a role in not only that last touch conversion and being able to attribute revenue back to that last touch of the affiliate, but there is incrementality being driven out of the program beyond that kind of last touch look. So when you kind of zoom out and look at all of the channels working together in the guest journey or the customer journey, you can see that it's so much more impactful than you even thought it was before when you just looked at it from the last touch level. Finally, more brands are doing that, hey? Yeah. It's really interesting, everything that you've talked about, you know, a brand here doesn't price promote. It does stick to its guns. It does stick to its values. You know, we are a premium property and that's what we do. Yet using affiliate marketing, which for many people, People is still considered a price promotional channel, which it's not. You know, you're using it for branding, you're using it to drive awareness, you're using it to build the perception of your product as premium, just doing it in a very smart way. It's really interesting and hopefully inspires a lot of brands out there as well. Hopefully. I hope I've been able to share some of my knowledge, I'm not proclaiming to be any kind of expert, but definitely have learned a lot of lessons in my time in this chair. Well, if it all started from you listening to podcasts, then I hope it might start for a few others out there stepping into a role and going oh where do I start well listen to this one and hopefully get some inspiration a hundred percent and if you have imposter syndrome you're not alone we all have it oh mate all the time well thank you Verity thank you so much for joining us really great chat and look forward to seeing where to next with Lululemon thanks so much for having me it's been great well that's a wrap for season two 
Thank you so, so much for joining. It's been a pleasure to sit here in the studio and bring such great and inspiring stories to your ears. Hope you've enjoyed the season and found some inspiration. Maybe some of you have tried something new in your own marketing programs. Maybe you've been inspired to launch your own brands. Whatever it may be, I hope you're doing it with a smile and a hustle. Please don't forget to give us a rating and a review. It helps others like you find us and discover new ways to scale their businesses and improve their marketing efforts. If you have any feedback, please email us. Our contact is in the show notes. This podcast is made possible by the amazing team at Commission Factory. If you're interested to get involved in affiliate marketing, reach out to the team. Links are in the show notes. I'm Michelle Lomas. Keep hustling and bye for now. Commission Factory.